time of quiet for our family. A time to pause and to reflect, to prepare our hearts, but also our homes. For us, it means decluttering, it means eating simple meals, it means spending more time in prayer. Today, I'd like to invite you along as I journey through the first week of Lent. I'll show you some simple recipes of the foods that we eat, show you how we declutter and decorate our home, and finally, just the everyday joys of living on our little homestead. I'm Justine, a mother to six and wife homesteading in Eastern Ontario. I hope you enjoy this glimpse into our lives. I couldn't mention Lent without first talking about Shrove Tuesday. I'm French Canadian, so we celebrate Mardi Gras, which is a time of indulgence, fatty foods, delicious meals. My husband, however, is English Canadian, and so he always celebrated Pancake Tuesday. I never heard of this until I met him, and although it was a little bit weird to make the switch at first, the kids really enjoy having pancakes for supper. And so here I am, Shrove Tuesday, making pancakes and sausage and some homegrown bacon. My pancake recipe is pretty simple. I just take sourdough starter discard, add some eggs, some vanilla extract, some butter, some baking soda, some salt, and then I mix it all together and I have pancakes. I apologize if I forget a few of the ingredients as I go through the recipes today. I'm going to be leaving all the recipes for you in the show notes. So if I miss something or you want to hear it again, you can look down there and just have all the information right at your fingertips. I'm currently working on a website for you guys um, so I can have all my recipes in one spot, but I am technologically challenged so it's going to take a little bit for me to get it up off the ground and until then I'll just keep posting in the show notes. They always say you should throw out the first pancakes that you make, but I think that's ludicrous. Who throws out pancakes? Despite this being the first pancake of the batch, I think it turned out delicious anyways, and I didn't hear any complaints from any of the kids, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that that's correct. The kids really look forward to Shrove Tuesday. It's the last chance for them to really fill up on sugary things. And so after this, they had some candy and some chocolate and they just ran around the house like maniacs. The next morning, we loaded the kids up into the van and we went to church for Ash Wednesday. Everyone received ashes on their forehead. The ashes represent our mortality. The kids thought it was pretty funny to receive stuff on their forehead. Most of them wiped it off pretty much immediately, um, but my eldest kept hers on. And with that began the season of Lent. For those of you who don't celebrate Lent, Lent is a period of time, 40 days, excluding Sundays, before Easter. During that time, we prepare our hearts by fasting, by almsgiving, and by increasing our prayer. It's a really great time to focus our minds back on God. Traditionally, on Ash Wednesday, we would fast and abstain from meat. Since I can't fast because I've been pregnant or nursing for the last decade, I usually just prepare very, very simple meals like the one I'm about to show you. So this first recipe right now that I'm making is a white bean soup that's made in the slow cooker. It's super inexpensive, very filling and delicious. First thing I do is I soak some white navy beans overnight. Um, once that's done, I drain them out in the morning and then I'll cut up some onions, 
some garlic, some carrots, and some celery. Maybe about like four carrots, four celery, one onion, five cloves of garlic, and I throw it all in the crock pot with those beans. Afterwards, I'll drizzle in maybe two tablespoons of olive oil, um, season it with some salt, some pepper, some thyme, um, a few bay leaves, and then I'll fill it up with water just to cover the beans a little bit, set it on low, let it cook all day, and at the end of the day, it's a delicious soup. A few years ago, my husband and I started listening to um, Dave Ramsey, and so we decided to pay off all our debt, and I really cut our grocery budget like hard, and this was one of the go-to meals that I made pretty much all the time, and even now, I still find it delicious and very filling, and so it's still on my rotation. To go with our soup, I'm throwing in a loaf of sourdough that I fermented the night before. This loaf is two-thirds white flour and one-third whole wheat. I find that if you're going to be making sourdough with freshly milled whole wheat flour, um, you need to be careful about the amount of whole wheat flour you add in because the bread does have a harder time rising and it doesn't create as bubbly of a texture. If you notice, my face is kind of scrunched up that day. It's not because I was in a bad mood, but because I had a killer headache. As moms, we don't often get a sick day. And so most of the time when we're feeling ill, we just have to push through because someone needs to watch the kids. Someone needs to prepare the meals. I thought about not filming at all that particular day, but decided against it. I don't want to sugarcoat my life and edit it out to only the good moments. And so there are bad moments too in this life where you are not feeling good and you still have to make supper. After several hours in the slow cooker, the soup is finally ready. And this is what it looks like at the end. I went ahead and I mashed a few of the beans right into the soup to make it a little bit thicker. And then I served it with that bread that I had cut. So as you can see, the texture is a little bit denser than a regular sourdough because of the whole wheat flour. Um, but it's not hard or inedible or something like that. It's still delicious and hearty. Because we're not having any meat, I'm being very careful about the amount of protein that the kids are going to have. Um, so to increase it, I serve that with a glass of milk. In the following days, I made some salmon, just frozen salmon, with some olive oil and some salt on top. This is a fairly typical Friday meal. I usually serve this with some green beans that we grew in the garden because we grew so many green beans over the summer, so we're still going through those. I do not blanch my green beans when I freeze them, I just throw them in a bag. I know it reduces the amount of nutrients in them, but I figure it's better than nothing. And I serve that with some coconut rice as well. Coconut rice is super easy. Just sub some of the water for some coconut milk and then add about, I don't know, a two teaspoons of sugar or coconut sugar and it's done. I actually got distracted by the toddler so I forgot about the salmon and it overcooked which is fine it was still edible. And to our frozen green beans I added some butter, some garlic and some salt just to add some flavor to them. The next day, the plan for supper was meatloaf and I needed breadcrumbs. So the very first thing I did was to take all my bread ends, bread butts as my kids like to call them, and I popped them in the food processor and just got them into breadcrumbs. Afterwards, I got some onions, 
um, out of our pantry. One day I will show you guys what the inside of this pantry looks like. It's just kind of an awkward spot. Um, my husband built this pantry for us last year. And before that, it was just um, a closet that was under the stairs. So he expanded that and put shelving in it for all my canning. And so I've been using it. It's actually a really great spot to store everything because there's no sun and it's quite cool in there. While I'm preparing supper, the babies, so the almost two year old and the actual baby are usually sleeping. And so this is a time I usually take to talk to my kids and they like to give me a hand with everything. So I get them to do simple tasks like peeling onions. Um, the older ones can cut things and it's a good time for us to bond. I'm not gonna lie though, I am not perfect. Some days I would rather just do it quietly and listen to a podcast or just have some alone time. Um, but I do think it's important that I teach my kids how to cook so they can leave my house knowing how to make basic meals. When I left my parents' house, I didn't have a good knowledge of cooking or baking or anything like that. My mom had given me a few recipes, so I had those written down on like, I don't know, 10 sheets of lined paper. And that was all I had. And so everything that I know now, I've basically taught myself. Um, it wasn't an easy road. I used to buy everything in boxes and have to look at the recipes 10,000 times. Um, so if you're just starting cooking, please don't look at me and think that this is the way that you need to be cooking right now. This is a process. This is 10 years of making three meals a day for an entire decade. For my meatloaf, I threw in three pounds of ground beef, some onions, some breadcrumbs, a couple eggs, some milk, some salt, and some Worcestershire, and then I just mixed it all in the pan. This has been such a lifesaver, this hack. Just mix everything in the pan, and so I don't have to dirty another bowl, which I really dislike dishes, so saving dishes is amazing to me. And so I just shape it into that, and then I went and I made a sauce from some home canned ketchup and some mustard and some coconut sugar. And I don't know what happened. I guess I must have zoned out because I put a lot of mustard. Like it didn't taste bad, but the sauce looked like the color was a little bit off. So next time I make it, I'll definitely be more careful with how much mustard I put in there. The meatloaf went into the oven for about an hour and a half at 350, 375. I did bump it up to 400 at some point because we were in a rush, but I don't actually recommend doing that because it did dry it out a little bit. I'm going to be serving the meatloaf with some mashed potatoes and some green peas. I always serve meatloaf with mashed potatoes and green peas. I think it's because when I was pregnant with my first, um, I had been put on bed rest for a week because of unexplained bleeding, and so I just wasn't feeling well, and I was worried about the pregnancy, and one day, my mother-in-law, she lived, I don't know, about an hour away from us, she showed up, and she spent the entire day with me, and she brought stuff for supper, and it was meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green peas. And I remember just feeling so cared for. Um, and so that's why I think I make meatloaf with mashed potatoes and green peas because it gives me warm memories. To the boiling water for the mashed potatoes, I added some salt. Um, I always do this because a few years ago when I was trying to figure out like cooking and how to cook properly and how to um, understand flavors. I read the book um, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat and it just talked about how those four elements are needed in cooking so that the flavors really stand out. And in the book they recommended to salt 
all your boiling water. So if you're gonna boil potatoes, add some salt to it. If you're gonna boil pasta, add some salt to it. And like a significant amount so that the food actually takes on the salty flavor. Most of it gets lost when you dump out the water, but some of it remains in the actual potato or pasta or whatever you're cooking. And so I've been doing that since, and it's really made a difference. As per usual, we added some sauerkraut to our meal. There isn't many meals that I don't serve sauerkraut with. I have some kids who love sauerkraut, some who don't, and so whoever wanted some got to have some on their plate. The next day, I decided to soak some navy beans so we could have chili the following day. Um, I have to leave myself reminders to do these things. It's not like I just remember out of the blue. So if I want to have chili, I'll write down soak navy beans and I'll do that the day before. Over the last few days, the snow finally came back. So it had kind of all melted off and formed like a thick icy layer, but then we had a couple snowfalls and so the kids were so excited. They were running around and making snowmen and sliding again and just having a blast. The winter is hard to get through if it's just cold without snow and the kids don't have a chance to play. I think it's very fitting that Lent begins in the middle of winter, when it's towards the end of it, but not quite. And we know spring is coming, but it's not quite there. It's definitely a time of waiting, a time of anticipation, and a time to prepare. Sometimes it means preparing for the gardening season, and in the particular case of Lent, it means preparing our hearts for the resurrection of Jesus. That afternoon, I decided that I would finally get around to decorating for Lent. Um, like I said, the first day of Lent, I felt really sick, so I just did not have the energy to get the Lent stuff out. And then later on that week, I decided it was finally time. And so I just like to put a few things in the house just to remind the kids of what season we're in. And so that little wreath represents the crown of thorns Jesus wore and the kids like to talk about that so I just put it up there out of the toddler's reach and then I got out a few more decorations just like really simple stuff um, that is just good for the kids to see and reflect on we have a little cactus I like to take out we got him from the dollar store like five years ago I think and we call him Lenny so he's Lenny the Lent cactus and these right here are our sacrifice beans. Um, so basically what I do is I fill up this small jar with these beans that I've dyed purple because purple is the color of Lent. And then whenever the kids ha do like a sacrifice or like a good deed, then they get to take one of those beans and they dump it in the jar. And at the end of Lent, on Easter, the beans magically turn into jelly beans. So for every good deed, they get a jelly bean. And so they find that really exciting. That night for supper, I wanted to make egg roll in a bowl. And I decided I want to throw in some beets just because we have some in the cellar. Um, so I headed down. To access the cellar, we have to go outside the house and go through to our um, basement, basically. Um, using an outside set of stairs. The cellar is a dirt floor cellar and we've kept most of our garden produce down here for the last two years. For the beets, I keep them all in five gallon containers that I filled with sand, making sure that the beets don't touch and they keep pretty well. I mean, at this point, they've been out of the ground for so long, some of them are starting to get mushy, so I have had to toss a few. Um, but overall, they are still in pretty good shape. I also grabbed a few apples and then whenever I'm down there I just make sure that everything's looking like it's not rotting or anything like that. 
Washing the beets is a must. I feel like there's a lot of dirt in homesteading. There's dirt in the garden. There's dirt out in the pasture. There's dirt in the chicken coop. There's dirt on your shoes. There's dirt on the kids' boots when they walk in the house with them. And there's dirt on the beets when we bring them up from the cellar. And so washing off the dirt is a necessity. Um, and even though those beets looked kind of haggard when they came out of storage, you can see that on the inside, they are still beautiful and red and vibrant. So I cut those beets up so I could fit them in the food processor and I'm cutting the carrots up to fit them in the food processor as well. And then I'm going to shred those up. I also cut up an onion and I am going to be dicing up some garlic as well. To serve with the cabbage roll in a bowl, I wanted to make some rice. So the very first thing you want to do with rice is to rinse it off. And once I was finished rinsing it off, I added some bone broth to it instead of the water to add some nutrients. While I was waiting for the rice, I started browning up some ground pork. And to the ground pork, I will add the onions that I diced up and the garlic. Afterwards, once that's all cooked up together, I sprinkled it with some salt, added some ginger, some coconut aminos, and a little bit of coconut sugar to give it kind of a sweeter taste. One thing that I've learned with cooking is that I cannot be a perfectionist about it. I used to fuss about recipes not turning out exactly perfect. I used to read recipes and follow the instructions to a T and it took me forever to get anything on the table. And now I just basically wing it. So if you're at the beginning of your cooking journey, if you are a new homemaker and you are just learning to put these meals together, don't be discouraged. It's really all about practice. Over time, you're just going to learn what goes well together. You're going to learn what flavors your family enjoys. You're going to learn what herbs you want to use and things. And eventually, you're just going to get it. It's just about practice. So right now, you might be reading all the recipes and following them to a tea, but later on, you will get the hang of it. To my mixture, I added some corn and then I threw in the ground pork and I serve that all over rice. That night, I wanted to get some cornbread started for the next day. I didn't have any cornmeal, so I ground up my own popcorn kernels, and to that I added some flour, some coconut oil, some milk, some sugar, and some sourdough starter. I mixed everything together and I let that sit on my counter overnight. The next day, I oiled up a 9 by 13 pan and to the mixture that had been sitting overnight, I added some baking soda, some baking powder, some salt, and a few eggs. And then I mixed that all together and put it in my 9 by 13 pan. I put it in a 350 degree oven for about 40 minutes. For supper, 
I was planning on making a butternut squash white chicken chili. And so that morning I had put a spent hen in the slow cooker and just let it cook in water all day long. Um, so that's what you just saw me take out of the slow cooker. I then cut up some butternut squash, some onion, and some garlic again. And I sauteed all of that in a little bit of lard in my big Dutch oven. People have asked me what the difference is between my spent hens and rooster meat versus my broiler chicken meat. And so we raise both and butcher both. I will label the spent hens and roosters so that I know how to cook them. A spent hen or a rooster will have tougher meat so you can't roast it like a rotisserie chicken. You're going to want to cook it low and slow so it's best to be used in a stew or a soup or something like that. I actually prefer cooking a rooster over a broiler chicken just because the carcass makes the jiggliest bone broth you've ever seen and it's just so delicious. Once the butternut squash, the onions, and the garlic have softened a little bit, I will add the broth that's remaining from the chicken right into my pot and I just kind of eyeball it, um, see how much liquid that I need. I will also add some paprika, some oregano, some cumin, and some jalapenos and then I let that simmer for 15 to 20 minutes. And finally I'll add the white beans that I cooked earlier in the day and the chicken that I picked off the bone. We serve everything with a little bit of cheese, some sour cream, and that cornbread on the side. It's just such a fantastic and inexpensive meal. And that's it for this week. If you guys enjoyed the video, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're new here or you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so. I'm here every Thursday with a new video. I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye for now.